so uh, today uh, uh, we have uh, Elizabeth Seven, Beth, <laughs> uh, talking to us, uh, and she's the founder and director of the Multi Solving Institute. Uh, she's an expert on solutions that address climate change while also improving health, well-being, equity, and economic vitality. Uh, she developed the idea of multi-solving to help people see and create the conditions for such win-win solutions. Beth writes and speaks about multi-solving, climate change, and leadership in complex systems for both national and international audiences. Uh, her work has been published widely including a nonprofit quarterly, uh, um, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, US News, the Daily Climate and System Dynamics Review. Looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Boaz, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I wish I could see your faces, but um, it's nice to be connected in this way. And I'm really looking forward to the next hour and a half. Um, I am going to share my screen, share a few slides and stories with you. Let's see, someone give me a heads up and let me know if everything looks right. Great. Um, all right, so I can't, I can't see your faces and that's not my favorite thing. Um, so we're going to use technology to try to be a little more connected here over cyberspace. Um, and Kelsey's gonna put into the chat um, a link for a site called Poll Everywhere. Um, and it, at different points, I'll kind of pause talking and have a question or so for you. Um, and the first one is just to say, why are you here? Like, why did you choose to come um, spend these next 90 minutes together? What do you cherish? What do you protect? Um, I think more than ever before, our attention can go in so many places. Um, and the gift of attention is maybe one of the biggest gifts we give each other. So, so why are you putting some of your attention here? Um, I'm gonna go to the Poll Everywhere site and make it go live. And so you should be able to start answering that question when you get to the link that Kelsey put in the chat. And then we should all be able to see the answers here on my screen. If um, if you're having trouble with that, I think you can maybe not the chat, but the Q and A. Um, maybe you can get some help through there. Okay, so environment, family, space, health, nature, community. Yeah, keep them coming. These are great. Um, a lot of people saying health and family and future, children, the earth, clean air, clean water, people. This is beautiful. Thank you. So this little word cloud, you know, is a bit of a snapshot of the 45 or so of us who are gathered here. Um, and what I want you to consider, and in some ways, if this is the only thing you remember um, from today, the idea of multi-solving is that each of these things we cherish that we're protecting that's under threat, um, each of them is connected to all of the others. And sometimes the easiest and most powerful path to protecting one might be to protecting many, to bundling these goals together. That's the premise of multi-solving. Yet most of our um, whether it's government departments or budget lines or programs or nonprofits, pick one of the things out of this, this cloud or sometimes two and try to focus on them in isolation. Um, for lots of problems, that's a good way to go. But for these complex and interconnected issues that we're going to talk about today, I've really come to believe that's not the best approach to take them on one at a time. Um, instead, it's this idea of multi-solving. Um, I'll give you a definition in a minute, but sometimes multi-solving translates better actually in a story. So I want to tell you two, and these are from case studies that we at Multi-Solving Institute um, uh, gathered the information on. So not our work, but trying to spotlight the work of others. 
Um, this photo comes from the UK and it's a project called Walk to School. And it wasn't a climate uh, project in particular. It was spurred actually by a crisis um, in children's health and specifically in the percent of children in the UK who were achieving the recommended daily amount of physical activity. So those numbers had been declining. Public health um, leaders were really concerned about the implications of that. And so the project brought together um, families, parents and kids, teachers, but also urban planners and city um, transportation and public work, public works departments to do an audit in various towns across the UK, towns and cities, of the routes to school. And they identified the obstacles, and many of them were safety, like lack of a crossing guard or traffic signal, um, things that made it uh, unworkable for children to walk to school. So they addressed those barriers, and they were really successful in that public health intervention. Um, they, they managed to increase the percent of kids who were getting the requisite amount of physical activity. Public health officials knew that that um, actually almost paid for itself in terms of the costs of the project, just because of the physical and social and emotional benefits to children. Um, they were healthier as a result. But a, new, a unique thing about this project was they paused to ask what else got better. And they noticed a few things. Um, first, they were able to measure a decrease in traffic congestion because now there weren't parents um, at school pickup and drop off time. There was less traffic in the streets. Saved money for families um, who didn't need to spend as much on gasoline and car and all of that expense of transportation. Um, was a reduction in air pollution, which is another win for kids' public health. Um, the air was cleaner around the schools at the time that kids were coming and going. Um, and uh, finally, of course, if there's fewer um, miles traveled by vehicles, there's less greenhouse gas pollution. And so actually, um, at least in a small way, this was a climate change protection project as well. So that's what we mean by multi-solving. One intervention is producing this branching, flowering kind of expanse of benefits. Um, here's a second one, and this also wasn't a climate project at first. Um, this is a program from the New, from New Zealand called Warm Up New Zealand, and it started also in response to a crisis, um, this time not a crisis in kids' physical activity. This was the economic crisis of 2008-2009 um, around the world and in New Zealand. Um, building construction slumped, which meant that um, there was a decrease in employment for people in the building trades. So this was a program from the national government of New Zealand trying to get that industry back to work. And um, they incentivized home energy retrofits. And that worked, you know, it created uh, good jobs in the construction sector. But they asked what else was happening as a result of that and partnered um, in this case with a university who did a health audit on the families living in the homes that had gotten um, the home energy upgrades. And they specifically measured um, visits to the emergency department and the costs of prescription medication uh, in homes that had been retrofitted versus similar matched homes that hadn't. And what they found was that, in fact, those health system savings outweighed the costs um, of the project in the first place to get those energy retrofits done. And so um, that led to, I think, a fascinating innovation in New Zealand, uh, which was that then the public health sector stepped in with more funding to extend this program. And they even set it up so that physicians could refer patients for home energy upgrades. Um, so sometimes I joke about that, you know, instead of take an aspirin and call me in the morning, it's like get new windows and some insulation in the attic. So again, multi-solving one innovation, in this case, home energy retrofits, is, is giving economic um, improvement. Um, it's also gonna save energy, of course, which has climate implications, and it reduced the energy bills of the people living in those homes. Um, and so that's something that's called the energy burden. So for particularly for people um, living on fixed incomes, utility bills are a big part of their expenses. Saving money on their energy bill means more money for food, medicine, education, fun, and recreation. Um, so win, win, win uh, solutions, that's kind of how we think about multi-solving. Um, the definition that we use at Multi-Solving Institute is using one investment of time or effort to solve for several goals at once in a way that also improves equity. Um, the fact that multi-solving 
uh, is possible at all, I think is, is due to the characteristics of complex systems. And one of the um, pioneers um, in the field of complex systems was my mentor, Danella Meadows. Um, she was one of the authors of the um, the book, The Limits to Growth in 1972 by the Club of Rome. Um, and one of her less well-known quotes uh, is one of my favorites, actually. And she said in an essay once, what we are rarely told is that solutions are as interconnected as problems. One good environmental action can send out waves of good effects as impressive as the chain of disasters that result from environmental evil. So the way I think about it, interconnection um, is non-negotiable. It's just a feature of reality on planet Earth. Our economic systems are connected. We know we're connected across the planet through our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, species are connected in ecosystems. Those ecosystems are connected to the tissues of our bodies and so on and so on. That can be a big problem um, in, in those spirals of side effects that we know so much about, but it can also be a big opportunity. Um, and if we're uh, intentional about working with interconnection instead of ignoring it or fighting it, um, there is this potential uh, for multi-solving. Um, there are as many kinds of multi-solving as, as you really can imagine. I think it's limited only by human creativity at this point, but I want to name some of our favorites and some of the most common types that we see around the world. Um, trees and green space are an amazing example of multi-solving. Um, they are a climate resilience um, inter intervention. Um, you've probably heard of the urban heat island effect, the way that um, during heat waves, the, the built environment with cement and asphalt uh, heats up more than the surrounding countryside. Trees and green space really uh, counteract that effect. You probably also know around the world, cities are grappling with stronger um, rain events where more rainfall happens in a shorter amount of time and that leads to flooding. Um, trees and gardens and green space act as a sponge and they can help soak up some of that um, water and slow it to have less, less flooding that is a risk to buildings and to people's lives. So there's, there's climate resilience. Um, there's all sorts of health benefits of green space that's becoming more and more understood from mental health to um, the way that uh, can improve air quality. Um, improving air quality means things like less asthma, less respiratory illness, less premature birth. Um, trees and green space, if they're done carefully, also create places for safe physical activity, recreation, um, walking, biking, and, and playing, and all of the social and emotional and physical health benefits that come with that. Uh, trees, by keeping the, the environment cooler, um, save money on, on air conditioning. That's also a climate change prevention because um, it means using less energy means creating less greenhouse gas emissions. And again, saving money for people who are trying to keep their buildings um, warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Walking and cycling, and we'll, we'll talk um, some more about some examples of this, but it's a huge multi-solving um, opportunity. It gets greenhouse gases reduced from the transportation sector more than pays for itself in terms of the um, increase in physical activity and decrease in chronic disease that comes along with that. Uh, study after study also shows that when cycling and walking routes go through neighborhoods, it increases um, economic activity along those paths. People who are walking at a human pace um, stop and, and um, you know, buy groceries, buy newspapers, buy coffee, and so on. And that economic activity can be a real boost to neighborhoods. Um, public transportation is a multi-solving opportunity. Another way to squeeze greenhouse gases out of transportation, um, but also an equitable way to provide mobility so that people who um, don't, don't have a driver's license, uh, can't afford or don't want to afford a vehicle are able to have access to mobility. Um, and mobility is one of the top um, factors for escaping from poverty because of the way that it opens up opportunities and access for, to healthcare, access to education, access to employment. So public transportation and investment in, in public transportation um, is, is a solution to many problems or a way to achieve many goals at the same time. And that makes it an example of multi-solving. 
uh, renewable energy um, around the world addresses many goals at the same time. Again, um, every time that renewable energy displaces uh, diesel generators or coal-fired power plants or oil burners or gas burners, it's a climate change intervention, of course. It's a source of good jobs that can't be outsourced, whether that's um, installation or maintenance of microgrids. Parts of the world that are limited by their access to electricity, um, renewable energy can provide energy access, which opens up everything from children being able to study um, at night, have, have electricity for lighting, to being able to keep food and medicine um, cool, to open up opportunities for small scale entrepreneurs. Um, and of course, uh, it also means that communities that were once dependent on an outside source of energy like diesel or kerosene, um, something that they had to pay cash for to distant companies, um, now can be more self-sufficient and, and use a local renewable source of energy. Um, energy efficiency, uh, like that warm-up New Zealand example, again, the benefits to um, basically jobs, healthier homes, reduced energy bills, and greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, we, we talk about multi-solving as bundling either problems together or solving for multiple goals at the same time. Um, and President Eisenhower, um, uh, I think, was one, of, was one of the thinkers who, who could see this potential. He said, once, whenever I run into a problem I can't solve, I always make it bigger. I can never solve it by trying to make it smaller, but if I make it big enough, I can begin to see the outlines of a solution. So that's the kind of thinking um, that, that we, um, we propose at Multi-Solving Institute, but, but more than that, that we see actually as a hidden movement around the world as people find ways to make problems easier to solve by making them bigger. Um, I don't know about you, but I know that, uh, so I'm trained as a scientist. I studied um, biology for my PhD. And uh, what I was trained to do was, was make problems smaller, right? To break them up into smaller pieces. If we can't understand the whole organism, we try to understand a cell. If we can't understand a cell, we try to understand a gene or a molecule. And, and that is a very powerful approach, but it's not the only approach. Um, and so we want to spend the rest of the time talking about going in the other direction and what that might enable. Um, so I hope that that gives you a, a sense of what we mean by multi-solving and a few examples. Um, and I'm betting that as you hear these examples, you think of things in your world. Maybe these are projects that you're part of, um, maybe things you're inspired by. So we're going to go back to Pull Everywhere and maybe... Kelsey will will put the link again in the chat so it's easy to find. Um, here you just type, uh, you know, not full sentences even, just a few words, but describe multi-solving that inspires you. Repair cafes, yeah, I love those, right? You might not know how to fix something, but you don't have to throw it in a landfill. Maybe you have a neighbor who uh, who loves to fix things. Food forests, right? A solution to food security, biodiversity. Um, sometimes also to, to things like the urban heat island, nature-based solutions, tool libraries, yeah, and any kind of sharing, seed libraries, awesome. Community gardens, these are great, keep them coming. Water testing, so I'm curious about that one. Um, there's lots of citizen science I know in the area of water. Community fridges, urban food security, community, kids' education, soil quality, book nooks, I guess that's another kind of sharing, multi-municipality clean energy transition plan. Yeah, we're going to talk about that spanning municipalities a little bit later in this talk. Green infrastructure, which is um, that whole category of things, green roofs, rain gardens, bioswales, worker cooperatives, native landscaping community-based climate education, curbside giveaway days. Yeah, in my town, we have a, um, a listserv and you can always ask for what you need or what you don't need anymore that you want to give away. Buy nothing days. Great. Um, well, you can keep them coming. I'm going to go back to the slides, but I do feel like, um, like you all are, are naming examples of multi-solving. So that's great. Um, 
so we want to, I want to spend a little time talking about why, why to multi-solve, um, you know, why to do this sometimes counterintuitive move of bundling goals together instead of trying to solve them one by one. Um, the first reason I'll name is for justice and equity. Um, I think it's fair to say that in certainly in the United States, but um, not only here and in, in many parts of the world, we know that we inhabit current systems that are widely inequitable across many domains. Um, in the United States, of course, structural racism being one of the major um, barriers to well-being in our society. Um, the fact that we need to change almost everything about our built environment, our transportation system, our education system, our health system, in order to prevent future climate change and adapt to the climate change that's already coming, like that is a huge thing to take on, how much we need to change almost everything. But think about any like home renovation you've ever done. Like when it's time um, to, to repair the kitchen, that's the best time, right? To make it the way you really want it to be, um, to, to put your values into this new creation that you need to make. So um, for instance, economic opportunity is not equitably shared in the fossil fuel energy system. Now we're creating almost from scratch in a very short amount of time, a clean energy system. We have to do it, right? Can we do it in a way where um, race and age and gender um, and immigration status and all those other barriers in that old system aren't barriers. And in fact, the opportunities and the burdens of a new energy system are equitably shared. So if we don't multi-solve, if we treat the energy transition as only a problem about energy and not a problem about justice and equity. We're not multi-solving and we're locking in the same um, inequitable systems that we already have that we know are not good for us as a society. Um, the second reason is, is frankly to win. Um, to address climate change requires overcoming the power of what Bill McKibben calls, um, you know, the the wealthiest and most powerful industry in human history, the fossil fuel industry. Um, that is the big lift. And it's going to be an easier lift if we multi-solve. And here's why. Um, this pie chart, it comes from work by the um, public health expert, Paul Epstein, um, who did a, one of the first uh, full life cycle accountings of the cost of coal in the United States. So for every ton of coal, um, how many? How much does that cost society? That's represented in this pie chart. Um, and here, this dark wedge, that's the climate impacts, right? That's the cost of the fires and floods and storms that are going to come along um, as a result of burning coal. And for the climate movement, which is my background in this work, you know, that wedge of the pie was pretty much all that we saw, all that I saw for the first big chunk of my career. Um, and it's not even the biggest wedge of pie. Look what else burning coal is doing. It's having this huge piece of pie in terms of dollars, a bigger effect than the climate effects on public health in Appalachia, whether that's the health of workers, whether that's the way that the toxins and water pollution that come along with coal extraction affect communities. Then there's what happens to our bodies whenever we're exposed to the combustion of coal, right? It produces fine particles like PM 2.5 that now have been implicated in asthma and stroke and cardiovascular disease and premature birth and dementia more and more every, every day, it almost seems. And traditionally, each of these wedges of pie has been tackled by different people in, you know, with different titles, right? This is like health researchers. This is public health researchers. This is climate advocates. You can bet the fossil fuel industry is glad that we think of those as separate problems because each of those is a weaker, smaller, less organized constituency than if everything um, and everyone that was suffering as a result of the burning of coal um, really saw that as, as common cause. And as I'm saying, bundled those problems or bundled those goals together. The third reason um, has to do with thinking about the time dimension. Uh, when I first started being an advocate for climate change, it often felt like what we were saying was, yeah, it's going to be hard, it's going to be expensive, but we need to sacrifice today in order to protect future generations. 
And there's some truth to that. But that misses the fact that a lot of what we need to do to protect the climate, and all, many of these examples we've been talking about, um, are going to bring us cleaner air and water, better jobs, um, more opportunities for safe physical activity, more interconnected communities, more food security, more biodiversity. Um, there are benefits today to the steps that we need to take for the future. And this especially matters when you think about political systems, um, where it's really hard to take a political action based on a benefit that's decades in the future. But if that if those benefits come along with um, benefits that are local for your constituency today, and we can explain how it all fits together, um, that's a that's a um, it's a political um, uh, political benefit as well as an ethical one, right? It says we don't have to always pit. The, the present and the future against each other, at least not until we've run out of all the things to do that protect the present and the future at the same time. And let me tell you, we are a long ways from running out of those things. Most of them we haven't done yet. Um, the last reason for multi-solving that, that we think about is, is good old um, frugality. If, if you can accomplish multiple goals with the same dollar or the same hour or the same campaign, why wouldn't you want to? Um, it, you may have to plan differently. You may have to work together differently. But at the end of the day, you can get more done by multi-solving. Um, we, we started with those uh, climate champion or multi-solving champions. Um, and now I want to share with you a simple little device that we use at Multi-Solving Institute. We call this FLOWER, and FLOWER stands um, for the Framework for Long-Term Whole System Equity-Based Reflection. But of course, it also looks like a flower. And one of the things FLOWER does is it just names um, categories of benefits that we think are ripe for being bundled together. Um, at the center of the flower is connection. That's connection of people to each other and people to nature. Um, jobs and livelihood and economic opportunities, resilience to um, not just climate disasters, but many of the shocks, um, you know, supply chains, pandemics for that matter. Um, resilience is a potential benefit of a lot of what we're talking about. Um, access to energy and mobility, food and clean water, climate protection, biodiversity, and health and well being. Um, and if you go to our website, and I think Kelsey can put the, the link in there, you'll find a lot more about Flower and some materials for using it. Um, but I want to give you just a little chance to practice and um, kind of test out what we're, we're talking about here in multi-solving. So um, let's go back to Poll Everywhere again. And we're going we're gonna to just do a couple practices. So first of all, um, Think back to the to a few minutes ago, and I was telling you about Warm Up New Zealand. Remember the program to um, to insulate homes, uh, but that ended up producing other benefits too. And you should be able to click on the little picture of that flower. And what I want you to do is click on any petal, either the words or the petal itself, that you think is a potential benefit of Warm Up New Zealand. So I'm seeing jobs, connection, health, climate protection, energy. Resilience, great. Like so, we're filling up that we're filling up that flower, um, and you're exactly getting the idea. Um, I think most of these are self-explanatory. Resilience, maybe a little less, but think about um, a well-insulated home and what happens if the power goes out and how long it stays warm um, in the winter or cool in the summer if it's better insulated, um, and you start to see potentially a resilience benefit. Um, all right, so you guys have the idea. So I want to go um, to one more example. Now, this one has two different flowers, and they're for two different opportunities, because I want you to think about whether every, every investment has the same potential for multi-solving or not. So on the left, think about an investment um, that creates more electric vehicles, let's say, in a city. And think about what are some benef what benefits you would expect to come out of that. And in the other side, and it looks like you're getting the idea, think about more walking and cycling. Um, click as many pedals as you think there are benefits. 
And one thing we say about flower is there's no, um, there's no like right flower diagram. It's a tool for conversation, for thinking. Often a really good question is like, how could we change this design to get another, um, another benefit? And if we had more time, um, a second layer that's really important with flower is to think about how all these benefits are shared and whether they are equitably um, shared across different groups of people or what policies might be needed. Um, well, I've never done this exercise before. I, I made this one up for you all. And so I wasn't sure what would happen. Um, I'm seeing, I guess my sense is a few more uh, those little teardrops on the right, on the walking and cycling. Um, and that's that's what I would expect. In fact, there's been some really interesting modeling studies um, done on electric vehicles versus walking and cycling. And one, one um, finding for a, a modeling study for London was that actually when it came to the emissions, the greenhouse gas benefit, so this yellow petal of climate protection, um, but two policies were basically about the same. I think I, one, one reduced emissions by 38% and one by 35%. Um, where they were really different was this blue paddle, health and well-being. Because more walking and cycling um, is, is from a public health point of view, an amazing intervention. And so where more electric vehicles saved, um, I think it was 17 lives per million people, and that would be from reduced air pollution, right? Electric vehicles are putting less um, particulates into the air. Um, more walking and cycling saved, I think it was 300 lives per million people. So that's um, cleaner air and more access to, to physical, safe physical activity. Um, so that's Flower, and check it out on our website if you thought that was interesting. Um, we've tried to set it up for teachers and classrooms, and um, you'll find materials where you can like print out uh, PDFs of these flowers and, and try it out in groups that you work with. All right, so um, the multi-solving gap is the next thing that I want to talk about, because so far... I've been painting a pretty rosy picture for you, right? Like it's amazing how many problems can be solved at once or how many goals can be advanced together. But, um, and that's true, it is amazing. And when we look for multi-solving, we find it everywhere we look on every continent, every sector, neighborhood scale, national scale. Um, but here's the thing, it's the exception, it's not the rule. And in fact, um, if we have a mission at Multi-Solving Institute, it's to flip that script so that multi-solving um, is, is the rule and not the exception. But, but let's look at, at kind of the current state of affairs. I'm going to give you just two examples, but um, they're more representative. Like you'll, you'll find evidence for the multi-solving gap everywhere you look. The first one has to do with COVID-19 and the huge amount of economic stimulus countries around the world put into um, recovery from the economic effects of the pandemic. Um, early on in the pandemic, early in 2020, a group of climate scientists saw the opportunity. They knew there'd be coming a big stimulus. And they said, hey, we could stimulate the economy and advance climate goals at the same time. So they basically said, we could multi-solve. They even did some math for what it, what it might take. And their estimate was globally for $1.4 trillion a year, um, uh, the whole world could meet for that year, you know, make the, make the progress along the path they needed to be on to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals. Um, so that would have been true multi-solving if 1.4 trillion out of um, the global financial stimulus went toward climate goals. Um, the stimulus has mostly been spent now, and we can ask what happened. Um, so that's shown here. Um, the global stimulus was around $17 trillion. So that's this huge bar. This bar, that's the $1.4 trillion those scientists said we would need if we wanted to be on track for climate goals. And here's what actually happened. Um, about $500 million on clean energy. So not you know, this this bar would have to be as big as that bar to have met that potential. And it wasn't, it was less than half. And even more sobering, uh, this bar here was stimulus funding that went into building more fossil fuel infrastructure, um, about the same size as the clean. So sort of like canceling each other out in some ways. 
Um, so that's the multi-solving gap, right? We had this potential to stimulate the economy and advance climate goals, and we didn't really fully seize it. Here's um, just the second example I'll share with you of the, of the multi-solving gap. This is from research done every year by the World Health Organization, and I have their 2021 results. The first thing is they said that the public health benefits and this is a quote from the World Health Organization, the public health benefits resulting from ambitious mitigation efforts, and by that they meant meeting Paris climate agreement goals, would far outweigh their costs. So think about that for a minute. Those Paris goals that we are not meeting globally, they actually pay for themselves in the public health benefits, according to the World Health Organization. Um, so knowing that, here's my question for you. Um, back to poll everywhere. According to the World Health Organization, what percent of countries do you think actually analyze the health code benefits in their climate policies? So the World Health Organization did an audit of all the countries in the world. Um, how many of them, when they make climate policy, are, are uh, factoring in health code benefits? So 100% means you think all the countries in the world are looking at health code benefits in their climate policy. 10% means, you know, one in 10 countries are doing it and so on. Um, all right, so I'm seeing a 10%, 20%. You all aren't too optimistic about the countries of the world and their multi-solving, are you? Okay. One last second to get your vote in, and then we'll go see the answer. So somewhere between 10 and 20% is what most of you think. Yeah, the World Health Organization found one in five, so 20% of countries analyze health co-benefits in their national climate policies. Um, that was two years ago. It, it may be a tiny bit better, but I don't think it's shifted very much. So why, why is that? Um, there's this huge potential and we seem to not be capturing it. Um, I think of this uh, sometimes um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but think of all of our favorite um, uh, fictional heroes and the landscapes that they traverse to, to meet their goal, right? Lord of the Rings, the map, all of the obstacles along the way of the journey. What, what do you, if you're setting out to multi-solve, what do you have to get across? Um, the first thing is the mountains of disciplinarity. You know, we talked about that a little bit in the costs of coal example, um, where you have people with medical degrees at hospitals and research centers working on the uh, air pollution's effect on our bodies. And you have other people who are um, climate scientists uh, at a whole different, probably different building, potentially a different university, speaking a different language, publishing in different journals, and so on and so on. It makes it hard to connect um, these silos. Then there's another obstacle, which you can think of as the swamp of budgetary silos. Um, think about these amazing innovations, like let's let's go to bike lanes. We've been talking about those a lot. Well, that pays off for the, um, the health system, but it's going to cost money to the transportation system. And there's usually not health experts or advocates who sit in the Department of Transportation making decisions about how the transportation budget should get allocated. So when it comes down to where to put money, um, most of the time, business as usual, that's done in silos. Then there's the, the jurisdictional rivers. Um, one of your examples was a multi-municipality energy plan back there when we were talking about examples of multi-solving you all have seen. And that's really heartening to me to hear. But that's also, I would say, the exception, not the rule. Um, an, a, a great example of, of how jurisdictions get in the way comes from climate adaptation. Um, we were talking about uh, more extreme rainfall and the potential of, of downstream flooding in cities. Often the cheapest, most effective solution to that is to protect wetlands way upstream in a river. Um, that also has huge payoffs for biodiversity and potentially recreation. But the money sits in one jurisdiction, um, the city downstream. The land is owned you know, by a whole different town or county far upstream. And without uh, financial mechanisms and MOUs and policies, it's not easy to get that synergy to happen. So that's the jurisdictional barriers. 
Um, then there's the forest of inequity. Like we live in inequitable societies and any multi-solving you talk about, I would be willing to say, um, is gonna require you to face historic inequity. Um, you know, yeah, let's get more trees planted and strengthen the urban, um, the urban can canopy for all of those multi-solving benefits we were talking about. Well, in the United States, as soon as you think about the urban tree canopy, you're faced with the legacy of disinvestment and the legacy of redlining um, because the health of the tree canopy, its abundance, the number of trees um, maps onto the disinvestment of, along racial lines um, that is built into the urban structure of communities in the United States. So before you do the first um, uh, you know, digging of your shovel to plant the first tree, if you're going to break those patterns, you have to know how to name them, navigate them, create policy to address them. And many people um, feel ill-equipped to, to take all of that on. There's just the simple desert of unfamiliarity. Um, some of these solutions are unfamiliar. Um, and uh, the process of working together in this different way um, is something people aren't exposed to necessarily in their education or in their um, early stages of their career. They don't know how to go about it. Then there's the quagmire of disjointed timescales. And I want to give a little special attention to this one because I, and I also would say the World Health Organization, glossed over something. Um, you know, the World Health Organization said the benefits of being on track to meet the Paris Agreement goals more than offset the costs of, of meeting those goals. And that's true. Uh, but what, what does it mean, those savings? Like those savings are from people who didn't go to the hospital in the future because they didn't have an asthma attack because there was uh, less pollution in the city where they live, right? That's what, say, electrifying and bringing renewable energy into a city would mean. Or that baby was born at full term instead of prematurely because its mother's pla its placenta wasn't um, damaged by fine particulates that its mother breathed in, or that grandmother didn't have a heart attack because she walked every day and her cardiovascular system was healthier. Those are amazing benefits, but none of them provide like dollars today to spend to put up those solar panels um, or to create those bike paths. So there's something that has to get overcome there. Rest there and, and people are hard at work on new financial instruments where investors can invest in, let's say, um, the solar panels and the bike paths today and um, get a return on investment from the health system that is gonna save a lot of money in the future. The health system gets a, keeps a little bit of the savings. The investor gets a little bit of the savings back and it all kind of works out. Like one of, example of that, some of you might know of is um, the, the instrument is called a social impact bond. But um, those are very few, far, far between and experimental right now. And um, until that part gets figured out, this timescale problem is a big obstacle to multi-solving. Um, Back to Donnell Meadows for a minute. Um, 1982, which feels many lifetimes ago, um, Dana Meadows wrote this in an article in um, Whole Earth Review. And I think it basically encapsulates all of those obstacles we were just talking about. She said, the world is a complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. It's super interconnected, right? That's what we've been talking about. We treat it as if it were not, as if it were divisible, separable, simple, and infinite. Our persistent, intractable global problems, and I would say our local, county, and statewide problems, arise directly from this mismatch. So multi-solving is honestly mostly saying, goodness, the world is complex, interconnected, finite. What if we tried to work together as though that were true? instead of insisting it's not um, and creating problems in our wake every direction that we go. Um, so what, is that, what does that look like? I guess in this last few minutes of, of my time, I wanna um, talk about what we're seeing about what, not so much these specifics of these projects, 
but the way um, the way of working. A partner of ours um, at the Multi Solving Institute is Partnership for Southern Equity, which is based in Atlanta. And the founder of Partnership for Southern Equity is a man named Nathaniel Smith. And one thing he's well known for saying is that equity is a way and not a what. It's not a particular policy. It's not something you do once. It's a it's an approach approach that you take to your work. Um, and we've borrowed from Nathaniel a little bit, or he's informed our thinking, I guess I'd say, about multi-solving, because um, we believe that it is also, multi-solving is a way. Uh, it's easier to talk about in, and show photos of children walking to school, addicts getting insulated. Um, but the real magic of multi-solving, I can't, I don't have photos to show you, or if I did, you know, it would look like a bunch of people around a conference table with coffee and flip charts, um, uh, working together, stretching across all of these fractures. Um, and I think of it as, as working with wholeness. Um, I'm working on a, a book about multi-solving and um, the subtitle to it is called Working with Wholeness in a Fractured World. Um, and there's something about multi-solving that slowly but surely um, heals some of the divisions and some of the fractures in our world. This slide has a lot on it, but it's it's our attempt to get at this idea of a way of being for multi-solving. Um, we, we created this slide because of a research project that we're in the middle of right now, which is um, a series of interviews with people who are, who are engaged in multi-solving projects across North America. And to know who to interview, the team of social scientists that we're working with um, basically said to me, like, how do you know it when you see it? How do you know multi-solving when you see it? And so we struggled with that for a while. And we came up with these four dimensions. Um, all of them exist on a continuum. So that's why there's each of these lines from left to right. And, and for each, we say that um, if most of the time your project is over here on this left side of the slide, we'd say that's probably not multi-solving. Um, and if for most of them, most of the time, you're further to the right, then we'd say that starts to be multi-solving with a lot of grace for this is hard, people are human, there are a lot of constraints, no one is all the way at the right all the time. Um, but we tried to interview people um, who, were, who were mostly working at this side of the diagram. So what are the four dimensions? Um, the first one is silo crossing. Um, and I think that's probably pretty obvious to you that multi-solving projects are, are um, almost by definition involving many departments, many disciplines, many jurisdictions. Um, the second thing that we think is important is multi-dimensional flows. If you think of, whoops, sorry about that. If you think of all the connections between silos as uh, you know, strings connecting people and organizations. Um, to be strongly multi-solving, what we observe is, I, for lack of a better word, goodness flowing in multiple directions. That might be money and resources, right? It might be uh, a large national organization re-granting to small community-based organizations. Um, it, it might also be flows of knowledge, and it might be um, a graceful um, dance between people with institutional power and institutional knowledge, you know, the sort of professionalized class, and people with lived experience um, who also have knowledge that's important to multi-solving. And so if we see a project where, where one day, um, you know, the, the executive director of a big nonprofit is at the front of the room, and the next time um, you observe a meeting, it's a grandmother from the neighborhood at the front of the room being listened to with as much respect um, that's kind of what we mean by multidimensional flows. Equity centering. Um, uh, in these types of um, projects that have many silos being crossed and resources being shared, there's almost always at least um, espoused values around equity. Um, and I think they're, they're, um, they might often even be sort of deeply held. But when they're put up against the test of, is it gonna take longer or cost more money in order to be um, consistent with this value of equity, um, the projects will choose to do that. That's what the right side of the diagram um, means here. So um, 
you know, it's time to get the RFP, the grant proposal written. And that one organization from the neighborhood um, that is, you know, not primarily English speaking, uh, you know, is not not yet comfortable with what you said in paragraph four or, um, you know, just can't sign on. And there's three minutes left and it has to get submitted. Does the organization submit it or do they not? Right, because of this value of equity and every voice mattering, that's the that's kind of where we're looking for that signal. Um, and then the last one is solidarity, which is related, of course, to all the rest. But solidarity um, is sort of the opposite of of transactional interactions. You know, there are political alliances. I'll vote for that candidate for city council if you vote for this ordinance. That kind of like horse trading. The other side is. Actually, the problems that keep you awake at night, you know, asthma in our elementary school children, um, they matter to me too, even though I work for an organization that's focused on water quality. Um, so that's what we mean by solidarity is, is um, uh, deeply holding the best for everyone in these partnerships that are doing multi-solving work. So if you want to bring more multi-solving into your own work, I would offer up um, these characteristics as, as something to think about and to talk about in your communities or, or with your partners. Um, I have a few slides here that are just some questions you can kind of keep in your, in your journal in your back pocket for your next meeting of your project um, that might help you find the way towards multi-solving. So here's the first one. How might solving my problem help someone else solve theirs? You could also word that as how might meeting my goals help someone else meet their goals? And if you can see what other goals could be lifted up along with your goals, you have the first hint at a, a potential partner, a potential ally, um, at least someone to invite for a coffee or to get to know better. Here's the second question. What would need to be true for the benefits of this work to be equitably shared? Um, one thing that's really true about equity in multi-solving is that it doesn't happen by design, by accident, sorry. Equity doesn't happen by accident. It only happens by design. It, it requires um, an equity lens or a screen at every step um, of your project. So that might be as simple as who do you invite to the first meeting? Um, it might be as profound as how do you structure um, the uh, employment provisions for the RFP for $100 million to install um, that new bike path. So from, from the very small to the very large, um, how are you designing equity into your multi-solving efforts? Um, and then, of course, who else needs to be involved? And um, the flip side of that is, what do I or what do we need to do to help them feel welcome? Honestly, who do I need to be as a person and as a leader um, to help people from that other municipality, that other neighborhood, that other discipline um, feel welcome and invited in the work that we're, we're um, beginning or the vision that we have? Um, I'm close to the end of my slides, so you can also start to be putting your questions into the Q&A. Um, in the Zoom interface, but we're going to do two final polls and then turn to the Q&A. So the first one, I just love you to think about what would you love about a world, a neighborhood, a nation um, with more multi-solving in it? You should be able to type in um, a word or, or a short phrase. What would you love about a world with more multi-solving? It would be elegant, wouldn't it? Peace. Yeah, and, and peace, by the way, is also a multi-solving intervention. If you think of how many resources and how many carbon emissions um, come from conflicts that aren't peacefully resolved, I think you could see um, both the budgets and the environmental benefits that we could we could um, harvest. 
we'd love a world with more multi-solving because of its community, its peace, its empathy, its collaborative nature, solutions. I think that I agree there would be vibrancy and efficiency. Fewer worries and more solutions. Beauty, cleaner air. Um, thank you. We have one last question. Um, toward all of those things, that peace, that beauty, that connection, um, that cleaner air. Can you think of one or two things and, and be really concrete and kind of short term, if you would, um, what's one action that you might take in the next month um, to open up a little bit more multi-solving in, in your part of the world? And this could be like, invite John for a cup of tea, co-write a grant, think about teaching a class um, with a professor from a totally different discipline. So I'm thinking that might be use a multi-solving lens in project planning, support getting rainwater harvesting at our community garden, plant giveaway. Yeah, just start by asking how your proposed solutions address more than one issue. Tell others about it, attend community meetings, bring two counties together for air quality monitoring. I love it. 5K for charity for families of deceased veterans. Listen. Yeah, you know, I should, I should say more about listening. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Multi-solving requires listening and sleep. That's a really good idea. Um, share your notes and ideas with your city councilor. Um, I think we'll find some way to share these slides through our, our hosts here. So if those are useful to folks, I'm happy to do that too. Um, say equity is a way and not a what over and over. Um, and if you do, please credit Nathaniel Smith Partnership for Southern Equity. Um, wonderful. So I'm going to close this, ask unlikely people to partner. You can keep adding your suggestions, but I'm going to go back to our slides. Um, really just to say thank you again for your attention. Um, you can email us at info at multisolving.org. Um, the best way to find out about events and new resources is our newsletter. And I imagine Kelsey's put that in the um, in the chat for you, but we would love to stay connected. Um, and thank you so much for your time. So I will stop sharing my screen and maybe we can just be more interactive and have a conversation by way of the, of the Q and A. Sure. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was so exciting. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm like, there are so many different things that, uh, your talk can kind of lead to and thinking, kind of broadly expand that that uh, statement, you know, like when I have a challenge, I'm kind of going big <laughs> to see how to how to go about it. I, I think it's wonderful. Uh, um, and maybe I'll start. So I'll give some time also uh, to the um, to the friends to kind of ask questions. So uh, like I was thinking about like an ideal space uh, for those conversations and like obviously you know, as a university librarian, I'm kind of thinking about libraries because a lot of the, uh, you know, things that, uh, you know, you were mentioning as like, you know, uh, silos crossing, much e uh, resource sharing, which is a whole function that we're, you know, uh, working on, uh, attention for equity and justice, deep attention to solidarity. Uh, there is a lot of work that libraries are really busy with and kind of see it as a core uh, mission for us to, to kind of make sure uh, conversations happen and that we're kind of we see ourselves as kind of looking broadly at the information scape uh, the landscape and trying to kind of connect people to to resources uh, and uh, being there to support that dialogue 
do you, do you have like you know like a, some you know ideas on where you know like those uh, things can happen? Where is an ideal? You know, uh, sit, you can obviously say libraries are the perfect place, which I, I'll be totally with you on that. But uh, kind of, uh, thinking about some of the challenges that you were mentioning, uh, you know, like the cross disciplinary, you know, the mountains of disciplinary differences and like the journal uh, scholarly kind of outputs that kind of don't talk with each other and all those things that are kind of relevant to university setting uh, in particular, but also, you know, like as us uh, trying to resolve some uh, uh, acute kind of challenges uh, around our kind of diversity inclusion and kind of thinking kind of how to promote uh, agendas that are close to our heart. Um, so what, what do you think? Is there like a place, is this like talking about, there is a lot of discussion around uh, belonging to spaces and how to make sure that people feel at home and kind of, and quite often that means customizing a space towards a particular audience you know so you know the the that audience is going to feel comfortable in that location and making them uh feel at home but in a way that may be different than what is the proposition here which is like to find a neutral space where you know people have you know like a, a multiple ideas, multiple opinions, multiple like a multiple forum, you know, which is kind of maybe talks more about distance and process uh, and less about the kind of, you know, the, the location where you're at home. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about it uh, in terms of like space and where, where, where those discussions can be facilitated in the best way, you know. You, you, you can think. Yeah. Well, there was a lot in that question for sure. But I mean, let's let's start with cheering on libraries as an amazing example of multi-solving. Um, uh, I'm back this winter. Uh, it struck home for me. And so I live in a small town in Vermont. We have about 3000 people. We have an amazing library. Um, and I went to return a library book. So there's multi-solving to begin with. Right. I didn't have to own that book. I'm sharing it with my neighbors. Um, I also picked up my three free COVID tests that the library had ordered and was distributing. So there's my public health one-stop um, option. Um, the front uh, entrance of our library has a, pu a jigsaw puzzle swap. So it's like you finished a puzzle, put it here, pick another one up. I peered through the window. It was like, I don't know, 2 p.m. And it was senior hour or um, I don't know, knitting and crafts or something. So some of my my uh, older neighbors in town were having some social connection and social cohesion, um, you know, and that was just one 10 minute stop at the library. Uh, and, and I noticed also all the other versions of libraries, right, that people are naming tool libraries, seed libraries, it goes, it goes on and on. It's quite radical, really. Um, and I was reminded that, um, that hasn't always been this way, you know, that the public library of the people is is kind of a new um, a new thing in some ways. So so there's one answer. Um, and I think there's room to even take that further. I'm, I picture the library in my town um, it actually has done this. We had a heat wave last summer and they have air conditioning and most people in Vermont don't. And so they open their doors to anyone who needed to cool off. Um, imagine if there also were solar panels on our library, which there aren't yet, um, and the power goes out, then there's a center where people can come and charge their phones. And around the country, around the world, people are experiencing or are experimenting with resilience hubs, right? These places um, that, that are there as a resource in the case of a disaster. Um, but they can also be community centers. They can be places that are public spaces all the time. Um, so I think it's limited only by our imagination and our willingness to cooperate with each other to create it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so here, I'm starting to kind of uh, read some of the questions. Uh, so Anna Stevenson is asking, uh, she's saying, <laughs> I'm loving uh, these literary metaphors that you were using. Uh, is there a publication uh, that can be referenced? Uh, uh, so uh, what, what you're, you are working on and what you're thinking of uh, in some of the references. And I think you mentioned a book that is being worked on. So <laughs> uh, any, anything like that that you can share with us? 
Yeah, uh, Kelsey may have a few links at her fingertips. I'm not sure, but the easiest thing is go to our website, multisolving.org, and we have a kind of a bi bibliography there um, and more, more to come, more in progress for sure. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, Tara Day uh, asks, uh, can you talk a bit about overcoming obstacles in working with cross-sectoral groups with everyone already stretched thin Yep, <laughs> and finding it hard to commit to collaborative work. Uh, so how do we insert that scope into our- Yeah, yeah, I don't wanna minimize that at all. Thank you for raising it. Um, some years ago, I was really excited about a potential project with a US state. Um, I won't name the state, but the governor had declared um, a task force on climate change to write their, I don't know, 2025 climate goal, something like that. And it was amazing because it had the Department of Housing, it had the Department of Health and Transportation. It was, they were poised for multi-solving, let's just say. Um, and I had an ally um, who was who's nominated to that task force and they, they were making the case to bring um, our multi-solving perspective in and, and try to have a multi-solving governor's plan and it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was um, the Department of Environmental Protection had been charged with delivering the plan and they had a very tight timeline. And that person whose job it was to deliver the plan said, you know, I got to do this thing in two months and uh, it has to have, you know, it has to have greenhouse gas numbers. It doesn't have to have anything else about housing and well-being it's going to be too hard. Um, and so it never got off the ground. Um, so a couple things that we're, we and others are trying to do to help with that very real po um, obstacle. One is to build the evidence base that it's worth it. Um, people perceive it as it's going to take a lot more time, but I think they underestimate um, other ways that are going to take time if they don't take a multi-solving approach, first of all. So yeah, maybe you can get your plan done quicker, but is it really going to get past the voters and the neighbors and all of those obstacles of people who are like, but you didn't consult me. So sometimes we think it's faster and it's actually not. Um, and so building that evidence base so people can point to that to advocate for working together more cross-sectorally. Um, the second thing I mentioned, this research project that we're working on. One of our goals is to help multi-solvers tell the full story of what they're accomplishing, because um, we we think it's actually very undercounted right now. Um, when you are, you know, healthier children and people are saving money on their transportation bill, and you affected the climate a little bit, and 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 it's um, and you're a small project, it's really challenging to even notice what you've done, let alone find ways to report it. Um, so we're trying to do some case studies that kind of aggregate that and also build new tools that make it easier to track all that change. Um, and so basically to give more ammunition when someone says it's going to be long and messy and hard, we want to be able to say it's worth it. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is like anything, you can become more skilled at it. And there's, you know, amazing facilitators around the world and around the country who are just talented at this and you can find them to work with. Thank you. Um, a question about government institutions. Um, so government institutions are infamously siloed. Uh, how can public servants working to implement their very specific mandate start on the path towards multi-solving? Yeah, I think that's a powerful question and I'm seeing hopeful signs too. Um, one is uh, um, in New England, I don't know how much you all follow um, this, but Massachusetts has a new governor as of January and her name's Maura Healy. Um, she's a strong climate advocate. And her, I think her first official thing when she took power um, was to set up the office of the climate chief. Um, and the climate chief is a woman named Melissa Hoffer who left the Biden EPA to take this role. And her job is to coordinate across all of Massachusetts state government and work with cities and towns across the state to achieve the governor's climate plan. Um, so that might look like 
you know, community colleges need to be involved in developing the workflow workforce to install heat pumps across the country, you know, like getting to that level of pragmatic detail. Um, so it's a hard, it's a hard job and I'm, I'm sure they're going to run into obstacles, but it's a new form that I'm pretty excited about um, to, to make that a responsibility of government. Um, and of course, the other example is to just look at um, the Biden administration. We might not all cheer everything and there have been compromises along the way, but from the Inflation Reduction Act to the Justice 40 um, requirements that, that um, require that spending to meet climate goals also benefit historically excluded communities. Um, you know, people are really trying to bridge these silos. Um, we heard uh, we heard of a new initiative. Um, you know, I guess the other thing I'd say is this bubbling up in maybe unexpected places. Um, but you know, coming from a health perspective in the federal government, but reaching out to transportation and housing and climate and building task forces that have people appointed from each of those departments. Like there's a lot, there's a lot going on and a lot of really patient people. I'm not sure I'm patient enough to do it, but um, I really bow to the people building those bridges. Talking about patience, Cat <laughs> uh, Morgan is asking this uh, in a statement, question in a statement, uh, that is the most common objection to inclusive processes, uh, they will take too long. Uh, I found it to be the reverse, uh, pushback even if it passes, uh, people don't resist change, we resist being forced, being told what to do, not having a say. If we're partners, we can move implementation much faster. So what do we do if it takes too long? Uh, and and is, is there a way to kind of process it in such a way that we're not, uh, you know, this is my addition, <laughs> how to kind of make it still yeah. go? You know? Yeah. Um, well, boy, I, there's a lot I could say. I agree definitely with that comment um, that it's not always quickest um, to take the shortest path. Uh, and also, though, to acknowledge this tremendous sense of urgency, like there are timelines, the earth has timelines for us, there are climate, there's a there's a carbon budget, and we're using it down and things do need to happen swiftly. Um, so all I can say to that is that we all get to live in that tension. Um, I, I don't know if you can see on my wall here, I have two, I have two quotes, um, because this tension um, I, f I feel it in my stomach every day. So one of them is from Grace Lee Boggs, the community organizer from Detroit. Um, and she said, it's not a matter of critical mass, it's a matter of critical connections. Um, and so when that urgency versus care, it feels like attention, Grace Lee Boggs reminds me, it's kind of a fake equivalence. Um, we may not need uh, everyone, but we do need to connect ourselves differently, and that takes time and that takes care. Um, and the second one is from Wendell Berry, um, and it's his advice to young people. And he says, The nature of your situation is an emergency, um, and it's a great challenge to your character to be patient in an emergency. Um, so that's what I try to maintain is that idea of. Um, you have to be patient if this work is going to be based on relationships and care and trust and all of these things we've been talking about. You can't do that without patience. Um, and yeah, you're patient in the middle of an emergency. Thank you. I, I guess that this is like more kind of the boss question <laughs> again, uh, thinking about uh, kind of benchmarks and kind of, you know, as, as, as it's, it's hard, you know, or, or maybe it takes the time to, in, in listening to uh, gather all the information perspectives all together, uh, thinking how to, you know, relates to this last question, uh, how do we uh, come up with the, light enough method to kind of keep things on the right path so like we know you know we have all those stakeholders we have all those challenges and we want to kind of make sure that uh you know like a strategic plan in in lehigh let's say you know multi uh there are lots of stakeholders lots of different kind of uh, opinions, how to go forward. We just uh, uh, launching a new one. 
uh, and then uh, you know, like we want to kind of make sense out of it every every few you know uh, months to make sure that you know there is a stability also in the way you go forward. So uh, you know, when when maybe when people are assessing you know uh, a multi solution kind of progress, there is that question of like how to make how to be the best efficient. You know, think about the relationships that you're you were just mentioning. Uh, and also be critical, you know, and like say, you know, like this is, you know, like here are areas where, you know, we need more, uh, maybe we just need to talk with, you know, like have more training around how to how to get there. Uh, but uh, is there like a way or something that you want to share about the kind of progress towards the goal? Yeah. Um, gosh, there's so many ways I could answer that. One way would be to talk a little bit about complex systems and also the nature of the times that I think we're in. Um, I don't know if it's ever been true that you really in this world make sort of steady directional progress toward a you know very narrow goal. In my work, I would say that hasn't actually been my experience. Things happen that you didn't expect, both for the good and the you know and and the setbacks. Um, but I think if anything, the last few years have shown us whether it's, um, you know, um, administrations in Washington, D.C. that change everything with an election or a pandemic that changes everything, um, that our, our ability to have a straight line path towards goals in the midst of a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, um, waves of coming migration, et cetera. I think that's an illusion. Um, if it ever was true, I don't think it's true anymore. So, so that doesn't mean, what do you do? It doesn't mean you just throw up your hands like everything is impossible and we can't do anything. I think you start steering and you start um, really asking what ground you stand on. And those um, that ground I think is values um, and vision. So values is what do you stand for? Um, and vision is what's the world that you want to see. And then amidst all that swirl, we don't have any choice. We're going deeper into swirl. Those are the ways um, I think that you steer. Um, in, in systems theory, those are called simple rules. Um, and they're what shape, they're what shape systems and they allow you to improvise. Um, and many people find it scary, you know, to start start thinking about the, the lack of control that we have. But I feel like I've seen the flip side and it's really inspiring. And maybe just one example of that. Um, I mentioned Partnership for Southern Equity. We collaborated with them before the pandemic um, and it had a small grants program. So a large funder um, gave us a budget that we re-granted to small community-based organizations. And it was meant to be um, to beautify their parks. Um, we, we made those grants before the pandemic, the money got dispersed, I don't know, a month before lockdown began. Um, and then we came back and saw what happened. And it was really, it's really um, inspiring to me what happened. One organization um, took their funds and instead of doing anything uh, to, to beautify the parks, they set up port, uh, like front porch um, trainings for senior citizens in the neighborhood to learn how to use their phones to get a telehealth appointment during the pandemic. Um, so the values were the same, right? Community service, the vision was the same. We live in a healthier place. And that loose way of working meant they could pivot where you know giant systems, like they couldn't provide toilet paper anymore, like the industrial system couldn't pivot. But community-based networks pivoted just fine. Um, and I think that gives us a lot um, to think about for these times that are coming. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question about capitalism. So uh, you, you said, I think, win-win, <laughs> you know, like as, as, a, as a way to go about things. And, and Megan uh, Powers is asking, uh, is uh, multi-solving compatible with capitalism? Uh, and how can we encourage multi-solving when the only bottom line is money? Um, my kids always say, don't get mom talking about capitalism. So I'm trying to choose my words <laughs> succinctly. Um, you know, the most important thing to be compatible with is the living earth of which we're a part. Like we don't have a choice about 
um, the rules of the game here. And I think multi-solving, we're trying to design it to be as compatible as possible with those are the non-negotiable rules. Um, at the very least, capitalism is going to have to reform a heck of a lot to fit into those rules. I guess that's that's what I would say. Um, and multi-solving is more interested in those fundamentals than in um, the current economic system. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's the last question and we are, have four minutes to go, so it's perfect. Um, and uh, so Anna Stevenson is asking, um, who's helping all policies program of action? And I'm not familiar with the, with the program. Uh, is very similar to multi-solving. And there are now many case studies demonstrating the value of this way of working. Uh, so if you can comment on, on that. Yeah. Um, so by you mean World Health Organization? So the it's World Health Organization's health. Yes. health and yes. all policies. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I'm not familiar with that specific program, but that overall umbrella of health and all policies um, is I think a really promising framing that is, seems to be gaining more and more traction. Um, and it, uh, for instance, um, in, in the incarnations that I'm aware of, um, does a really good job of just facing straight on, for instance, structural racism and its impacts on health. Um, and it's just a reminder, whether you're looking at transportation or education, um, there are health outcomes that will be shaped by it. Um, so I think it's a version of multi-solving. And um, uh, sometimes that framework broadens to also include climate. I don't know about this particular program, whether it does, but I think that's when it becomes um, especially powerful. Thank you. Uh, so we ran out of time. It was, it was so interesting and, and uh, really kind of opening lots of uh, ways by which we can approach our lives and, and uh, challenges. Uh, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, and, um, you know, I think people know how to reach you. So that's good. Great. <laughs> And uh, and uh, we we want to thank everybody that was here today. Uh, the the uh, session is recorded, so it's going to be on the LTS uh, Talks website. Uh, and uh, yeah, till next time. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Kelsey, as well. Thank you, Lois. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>